Okay, so um, I'm going to talk more about projects that uh, I worked on. Tom gave a really great introduction. I think that'll be a uh, uh, supply that I'll we'll rely on. But uh, this will be more kind of self indulgent talking about my, my own work. Um, but I did, I added this while Tom was talking. I, I don't know if, if people are familiar with the type of data that comes off one of those sequencers he took a picture of. So this is um, the format that comes off pretty much every sequencer right now. Um, and this is three three records. Uh, each record starts with the at and then the name of the name of the read and then the sequence and then the plus symbol for some reason and then a bunch of quality scores which tell you how confident that the sequencer was in the base call that it made in the in the second line. So you have the name, the sequence, the plus, and then the these quality scores which are um, confidence in, in the calls. So a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of the data that we get looks like this. Um, and I, I was trying to get the, you know, give you, show you how uh, big this file was, just an example project that I had. Uh, but yeah, I let it run for 15 minutes and then I didn't want to run out of it. I wanted to get this in my presentation in time. But I think that has about um, 25 million reads in it, so it's about 100 million lines. So, and that's a relatively small data set because that's a targeted one. So that's the type of data that we're, you know, thinking about. And so, uh, you know, then in order for these to be useful, then of course we have to map them back to the to the genome. So that's just a little side note. So, the what I'm really interested in is kind of integrating data. My job is I, I work in a lab, uh, and I I get all the data that comes through the lab, and I have to analyze it. And, Kind of make sense of it, although you know the people whose project is do, do a lot of that. Um, and um, we kind of hit common problems, which is that you know, say we'll detect gene, gene expression and, and uh, detect methylation, which I'll talk about, and then we'll get you know the results, and then it's they're kind of these separate things. And so I want to talk about how I've been trying to think of ways to integrate them better, and you know, not just gene expression and, and methylation, but uh, general uh, genomic and other data like microbiome. Um, so gene expression uh, is, is basically when you, the, the proteins, we can't really measure the proteins in a high throughput manner, so we measure these, uh, the RNA, uh, the messenger RNA. And uh, the reason is it's a lot cheaper and we can do it in a high throughput fashion. Um, the reason that we'd be interested in, say, gene expression is that, say, in asthmatics, we we may we will we expect to see genes that are related to the immune response at, expressed at higher levels than in healthy individuals, something like that. But we a lot of the stuff that I do, we're we're fishing. We're saying, well, what what is different in asthmatics, and then you know we kind of explore that further once we find those differences. Um, so the still the most common way to do, detect uh, gene expression is using what's called microarrays. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about, including microarrays, work by this base complementarity. So A all pairs with T and C all pairs with G. And so if you know one, that you know double, the DNA is double strand. So if you know one, you can if you know one strand, you know the other. Uh, and so we have a, a fixed set of probes attached to the microarray that are complementary to known pieces of the expressed. Uh, or the, or, the micro, or the messenger RNA. And the probes, because of this complementarity, they, these things want to line together. And so they're, um, they, they do, and the, the, your, basically your sample that you send in will bind to these probes and then something like it that they'll read out in the fluorescent intensity relative to the quantity. And so what you get out of that is something like this. This is an example I'm showing of the data where you, we have about, uh, after filtering, about 23,000 probes. Um, and then, you know, the number of co the columns are the samples, the rows are the probes. 
and then these are the numbers, and so we're trying to find something from these numbers. Uh, the, the newer way, which people are starting to do, is still more, a lot more expensive, is to do RNA-seq, and so anything that depends on seq is obviously sequencing, um, so you actually have to you know, sequence the DNA. So um, part of that involves uh, aligning reads back to the genome is a difficult problem. It's solved by very smart people um, pretty well, but this, I think, is fair to say it's still an, almost an open problem. Uh, is that you know when you get the messenger RNA, you have the intron spliced out, and so um, you can see these these introns are the black areas in there, and so what's left is the ex these exons, and so when you get the mRNA, you don't you don't know where the introns are when you when you get the the reads, and so these reads may um, you know cross cross a junction. Uh, and you have to align these back to a genome that. They, well, you can also align them to the transcripts, but in general, people align to the genomes. And so, there's a lot of methods for these, and there's actually a recent paper that shows up shows that they have alarmingly different results. So this is still, uh, you know, a, a difficult area. But if you want to map to the no, no transcripts, it, it's it's very good technology. Um, so Don talked a little about alternative splicing. That just means I, I tried to. I'll show a little picture down here. It's a, a, a very great picture. But so this is all with, from a gene called RIMS1, and these are uh, was it five different transcripts. And these these blocks are the exons. You can see how most of the gene is introns. You can see that each of these transcripts has a different set of exons that it's, uh, you know that, that are in in the actual transcript. Um, so from RNA seq, you can get more information. Like usually with Microarrays only get one, uh, you only get a gene, maybe you can get one or two transcripts uh, just by chance of how the, the probes are laid out. Um, here you can get alternative splicing these different variants. You can get genetic variants, meaning you can find these um, single nucleotide variants or, or, or maybe larger nucleotide variants from the sequence. And you have a much finer resolution to detect changes than you do in uh, micro microarrays. So on to DNA methylation. Um, so just really quickly, generally we think DNA uh, methylation regulates gene expression, uh, and it's a heritable mark somewhat uh, on top of the genetic information. That's what we call that genetic, and it occurs only at cytosines. And in humans, it's uh, very largely only cytosines that are involved by guanines, uh, and so. The most common method for detecting it is doing bisulfite sequencing, or some by treating with bisulfite and then doing some type of um, other detection method. But basically, when you treat with bisulfite and then you do the sequencing, uh, the unmethylated C's, yeah, that's right. Unmethylated C's appear as T's, and the methylated C's remain unchanged. So you can think of the methylation like pre preventing this conversion. And so the way that's how we we detect that. Um, and so this is an example of uh, a few reads mapped to it. the genome on the bottom and then the reads kind of displayed in a pictorial format. And, and you can see you have these mismatches. Uh, and that's where the reads were, these, I think every, pretty much every site I noticed on here that can be uh, methylated is not. So these are all, all these reads show converted. Um, so they, if, if they had had a uh, methylation, you know, this is a C, so it can be uh, converted into a T if it's not methylated. You can see they're all converted to T. And the reason why we see um, G and A is because uh, they're, they're on the reverse strand. Um, and so you can actually, from this picture, you can get an idea that there's a little more difficulty when you're mapping by some like treated reads back to, to the genome because. If we're trying to map all these, a lot of the algorithms work, they find a long seed and then extend from there, but you can't find a long seed when you have all these mismatches to the genome. Um, so, you know, each each one of these would be treated as a mismatch, so that, that there's some difficulty in that. Um, so, you know, by sulfide sequencing is, is what we used to uncover that, but in order to uncover it, we have to map it back to the genome in order to determine uh, what, what their methylation state is. And, and again, the mismatches are a problem for the mapping. 
Uh, so this is something I worked on a couple of years ago, and that there was no other tools to do this. Uh, it's pretty um, pretty simple algorithm. Basically, we we just kind of do uh, kind of cheat and, and just convert all the C's to T's in the reads and all the C's to T's in the genome, so that then there's no mi mismatches. And then in order to determine the methylation status. Uh, uh, and by convert, I mean, you know, programmatically when I get the data, I, I convert it and then I align the converted, you know, reads. I take all the C's and convert the C's and I align them back to this new genome I've taken. And then uh, in order to recover the methylation, the methylation status, you, you find back the original read, the original genome sequence, and then you, de you determine whether it's methylated or not by if it's, you know, if it's a genome, if it's C in the genome and it's C in the read, it's not methylated. It's just, if it's a C in both, it is methylated <coughs> for the most part. Um, so the software that I had written wrote uh, output something like this, um, and so these can be used as uh, as input for other things where we're looking for regions that are, say, differentially methylated between, um, you know, case and control, basically. Um, so back to what methylation does is. Uh, you know, we, we, the reason we measure it is because we assume that it, it's regulating gene expression. And usually we think that it's gene, it, it regulates the expression of genes that are nearby. Um, what nearby means can vary. Uh, but usually the, the core promoter of the gene is within a few um, thousand bases. And so generally you think if you have um, increased methylation upstream of a gene, you have decreased expression. Um, and so, this is just another slide to show, you know, you don't have, generally have methylation near the, as TSS on the left, there's transcription start sites, so that's where the genes start getting transcribed. So you don't have, you don't, wouldn't have methylation there because you, otherwise you wouldn't get out of transcribed and uh, the methylation increases into, into the gene and upstream of the gene. And on the right is a, a very important thing is that Methylated sites are highly correlated. So if you have one uh, CPG that's methylated, the one next to it is very likely methylated as well. And so this makes it so that when you you know do statistical tests on these things, you have to take this correlation into account. Um, and this is showing uh, actually this kind of gets it. Uh, I don't know who's it was that asked about how, how different tissues express uh, or you know, do different things. And these are these are actually I think. Right. Yeah, tissue DMRs. Um, so basically, differences in methylation between uh, tissue. And I, actually, I don't know if I spelled that out, but I, I always say DMR, but it, it, that's differentially methylated region. Uh, and so, what what we what if 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 we always saw the relationship of increased methylation and decreased ex increased methylation and decreased expression, and vice versa, this kind of negative inverse relationship. In this figure, we would expect to see them in you know the, the lower right and the upper left. And you can see that that's kind of true, but you can actually see uh, there's quite a, a, a dense area of points in the um, the upper right, or maybe the right close to close to the uh, y-axis there. And so, you know, this is, even though the tissue DMRs are pretty strong because you're looking at two completely different tissues, but, but even so, we have these kind of differences. And, and so what I'll get to is that this, these are post hoc comparisons that they've measured methylation and they, they are, they've done the methylation analysis, done the expression analysis, and then afterwards said, how are these related? And so that's what, you know, I, I'm interested in doing a more integrated analysis than that. Um, and, and part of the reason that I start on this is that we all have these projects where, you know, we have these expression changes and we have the methylation changes. and they, they don't. There's little overlap, and uh, there's the, the methylation changes don't explain a lot of the gene expression changes. And so this is kind of a, the idea of you know, it's not entirely what we do. I mean, we do a little more sophisticated things when we're trying to relate them. But uh, this is what generally what we and a lot of people do is that. We do a methylation analysis, get the results on the left, and then we do the method, the expression analysis, get these results on the right. Obviously, these are fake results, but 
you know, and then we say, oh, how are these similar? And the reason is it's hard to do, uh, um, you know, this integrated analysis. Uh, another reason is that if you do uh, an integrated analysis, in this figure I, I plotted for one project, all methylation probes along the x-axis and all expression probes along the y-axis, and then if you think if that thing were full of dots, that would be every comparison that I did for this analysis, and the dots that are uh, shown are the ones that were had some uh, p-value that I deemed uh, significant enough to show in this figure. And I, I, I can't remember what the number of comparisons it is, but I have a slide later where I'll show you with, with even with well, I think it's with, say, 20,000 expression probes and 100,000, and someone can do the math better than me, I'm sure, but with 20,000 expression probes and 100,000 methylation probes, you're going to be doing 2.5 billion tests. And so, you know, you're going to get a lot of false positives. And that's, you don't really want to do something like that. Um, and so, any, however you do these analyses, traditionally, they're, you, do, you fit a linear model at, at each probe. And here I'm showing the example for expression. And then we want to know how is uh, disease, uh, how is disease associated with expression. You can, you know, you can switch disease and expression. And, uh, but generally the way it's, the software that does these tests is written, it's easier to do it uh, the way I've written it. And then we report genes with this corrected p-value. So we're doing a lot of uh, tests. So we report a corrected p-value less than 0.05 or whatever cutoff we decide. And then, you know, we do uh, not just the simplest analysis, we account for batch effects and study design, all these things. And uh, so another, just another note about multiple testing. Um, if we're testing 40,000 sites, which isn't really that many in a lot of these assays that we'll do, uh, how, do we term, how do we determine which ones are really different? Um, you know, and, and not just uh, uh, because we're testing so many sites, we happen to find something some things that were different. And so, you know, just to state the obvious that by definition what a p-value means, that uh, if we do 40,000 tests of random data, we'll find 2,000 false positives with, with a nominal p-value of 0.05. Um, methylation, same story, although on, on the methylation arrays, uh, we'll have 480,000 probes and you know, sequencing will have a lot more. But even with only 480,000 probes, if we do single probe tests, we got to do a lot of multiple testing corrections. So, you know, here I'm showing basically a Bonferroni correction where I divide 0.05 by the number of tests, and we have a very stringent threshold. And you know, we're looking at kind of subtle diseases like asthma, where, and, and we're looking in blood, we're not looking in lung tissue. So we're, when we find changes, they're pretty subtle, and we're not. <coughs> We won't find the stuff if I have this cut. Um, but this is somewhat of a straw man because in methylation, most most methods will aggregate across probes because adjacent probes are correlated. So you can get gain power and reduce the number of tests that way. So <clears throat> this is an example of what a very strong DMR differential methylated region would look like. I, I in our data, I never see. DMR is this strong, uh, but uh, so the blue dots are basically a normal patient, the red dots are a cancer patient, and this algorithm from this, it's called bone hunting from this group that does a lot of really great stuff on uh, methylation research. Uh, their software is called this uh, a DMR. So what I, what I want to do is be able to find very subtle, small DMRs with small effects, and of course minimize the false positive. And so this is an example. It's in a different format, but this would be a two-probe DMR. You know, we have enough samples that I can't just draw the points. So I, it, it, this would be, I think the bottom it cut off, but this would be one methylation, one site in the genome that's measured, and now be another site in the genome that's measured. And this histogram on the right is showing the distribution for disease. Mm -hmm. On the left is showing for uh, control, and so whether there's even a difference here is debatable. But you know there could be, and we want to be able to detect very small differences. Um, so just to kind of review what these DMR differentially methylated region finding methods are, is just the bump hunting. 
uh, which is actually from the, this is from the bump hunting paper. Um, they fit a model, and then they fit they find the coefficient for uh, for, for say disease status, and they they take that that coefficient, and then kind of do a they actually do a smoothing so that adjacent coefficients form these bumps, and then they generate generate simulated data and see how how those bumps stand up to the bumps that they see in sim simulated data. Um, so it's pretty computationally intensive. And from what I can tell, it works best if you have long and long, at least long EMRs, if not with those with very large differences. Um, so last year, I, I had developed a method to basically get still fit a linear model at every site and then do kind of peak finding on the p values and then do a correction for com do combine the p values using a correction that takes into account the correlation um, and this is a whole software pipeline that you can run on anything that has p values and some sort of spatial idea of space um, this year I think it's this year yeah these guys came out with this this method uh, which I, I really like uh, they first instead of testing everything they find chunks of the genome that are correlated. So they take the probes and say, are these, these so I have, say I have 40 samples, I have these probes here, and in an adjacent side I have, you know, obviously another 40 probes, and I see if these are clustered, and I can do some, you know, type of clustering. They use single linkage clustering to merge probes if they're correlated and within a certain distance. Then you do a test on that cluster. So then the, the that reduces obviously the multiple testing problem because you're, you're testing on clusters of probes rather than single probes. And the way that they handle the correlation is using these generalized estimating equations, uh, which is it's basically a way to handle this correlation. They have, they have various assumptions. Uh, and yeah, I think that they did a really nice paper. So this, this shows their, their method is, you've probably seen diagrams somewhat similar to this where, where you do this clustering. It's, and they're, they've drawn clusters for a small portion of the genome in the, in the boxes here. So, you know, obviously you're only going to be uh, clustered with things that are in your local area. But the problem with this, which I think is a problem with a lot of software, is in order to generate these, they read everything into memory. And uh, so what I what I, since I, I, I did, really, I thought their paper was really interesting and great, so I basically took their method and in order to use it on our data, which I can't read into memory for the most part, is I developed this kind of streaming clustering. So if you know your data is sorted, then you can do tr almost traditional, uh, what they call agglomerative clustering. Uh, without reading everything to memory because you're just looking at the stream of data and once you reach, once if, even if nothing's correlated, if you reach your last data point or your, your next data point and the ones that you're, you know, keeping in memory just in case it's correlated, if they're too far away, you just can take this cluster and send it back to the calling program and then continue through and so you're not reading everything into memory and then in this case I'm showing that, uh, I'm, I'm just showing it. this is actually the, uh, the signature of function and you can take the, the cluster, which is what comes out of this software, and run it on, a, run it, compare it with a model, or test it against a model, and then yield the results. So you can do this whole thing in streaming over this, this data without ever reading it into memory. Um, and so that's the basis of, uh, part of the basis of this software that I have started to, to write um, to, to find differentially methylated regions uh, and basically the, the parts of it are to find the clusters uh, which is great because it reduces the number of tests then do trans transform the data this can be you know any number of things but you know you can do outlier removal or whatever other transforms you want and then assign significance with any of these methods that have been in implemented in uh, previous uh, software So uh, this is since 
it's a lot easier to do modeling in R, and it's a lot easier to do kind of data processing in Python than this project uses both of these. So I, I kind of do the streaming in, in Python and then send it, send it to R to do the modeling. And I use this software called Piper to communicate between them. And I also write uh, binary files so that you know I can write them very fast and read them very write them very fast from Python and read them very fast in R because it's sending can be sending a fair amount of data back and forth. Um, so I, you know I've written a few R packages, but uh, I think it's a little funny uh, story is that I I was trying to make this a proper R package and uh, make it pass all the requirements. And I had a few warnings. I don't know if anybody's written R packages and tried to submit them to CRAN, but in Python you submit it and it's like automated. But in, so in R I had a few warnings and I submitted this package. And uh, I get I, I was waiting to hear back from some automated thing what exactly what I could do. I get an email from uh, Brian Ripley. I don't know if any of you know who that is, but he's uh, writes textbooks on ecology and uh, is a big R guy. And, uh, a very scolding email telling me that I should not be doing that. So definitely uh, the reason why our package environment is so good is there's uh, Brian Ripley's uh, <laughs> gatekeeping. Um, so since I didn't get it on the CRAM, then you can install that the package this way. And it works on any cluster data uh, and you just it all, all the functions take the same format and they implement all these different uh, methods that I show at the bottom are means of testing a cluster of correlated sites at the bottom here. Um, and so from the, 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 the front end that, that I use is from Python. Uh, and you know, basically you specify a model in the R syntax and give it some covariates. The methylation, which is probably a huge file, this, uh, may have, you know, uh, well, in the case of this uh, microarray we're using, it has about 480,000 sites. And so it streams over this and outputs the results. And so this, if if you guys are familiar with the R package, the LME4, this is the syntax for specifying uh, a random intercept by CPG site and random intercept by ID. And so those things get added automatically by the, by the software. Um, if you want to test it with test getting the p-value for each site and then combining them with the z-score method, this is the syntax. So if all you're changing is just a couple flags. If you want to use the uh, GEE with autoregressive by ID, this is the syntax. So th this gives me a nice setup to test which of these methods is working the best. In order to test them, I thought. Uh, I do what everyone does and simulate data. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a reference to Reddit if anyone gets that. And then um, it, it's it is hard to simulate correlated data though. You know, you you, you want to simulate you may you want to simulate data with differences between your simulated cases and controls, but you need to account for this correlation. Um, and then regardless of how we handle that, then the assumptions in the simulations drive how we have tuned the algorithm. So the, the same guys who wrote the A classroom paper came up with a method and basically they they take real data and say I'm going to generate two groups and just have a weighted uh, selection of each group um, in their pre-selected you know clustered regions and so they just say well I have the high group and the low group and I do a weighted selection weighted random selection and so you know if they have a high methylation value they're more likely to occur in high groups so they generate differences that way. Um, the bump hunting folks, they use this autoregressive model with um, a T distribution, and that's what this is pretty easy to do in R. Uh, and then they insert DMRs, uh, and they, again, this, they use very long DMRs, but you know, we want to find small ones. Um, the other thing you can do is take existing data and just shuffle the case control status. So, just really quick, uh, I'll go over. Uh, one of these figures for a few of the things, but on the right is essentially a QQ plot, and on the left is the, the distribution of p-values for the showing the same thing. And so this is on 
random data, so we shouldn't see anything. So the, the distribution should be flat on the left, and the line should be at, at the diagonal on the right. And uh, I'm showing, I guess, that I did 60, about 67,000 tests. So at 10 to the minus 4, we expect to have about 6.7 less than that cutoff. So for each of these, I'll show how many were less than the cutoff. Um, this guy's, uh, actually, this guy's common use to test rare genetic variants, but you can use some ventilation data. And it doesn't like missing data. That's why there's a bunch of uh, p values of 1. Um, the mixed model with intercept by sample uh, has, uh, so again, we'll look for the flat distribution on the left, basically. So th these are just kind of showing this is the, the worst, one of the worst, I think. Um, you can see that's extreme infl inflation. So you're getting a ton of false positives, basically. Um, and then uh, if I do autoregressive by sample, it's okay because there's only 35. Values less than 10 to the minus 4, so that would be 35 false positives at that level. Um, this one is quite bad. Um, and this, I think, they don't say explicitly if they're doing, in, in the A clustering paper, if they're using exchangeable by the CBG or by ID, but uh, I think it's by CBG. NIPTAC has a funny distribution, but very few false positives. This is a method of correcting p values on general test. So, uh, basically, there's a lot of questions about these, you know, because I, if you simulate the data differently, I get slightly different results, and that's only, actually that's only showing you uh, the false positives. Here's showing you if I generate, if I simulate DMRs into the data, how I can get true positives, and this is just showing all the different methods. I'll, I'll just skip over that. Problem is, we're still not using incorporating methylation expression. The R outputs depend on the assumptions. So here's the again the example usage. The main thing is there in bold, which specifies that we want to say that methylation is some function of the case control status, and there's you know a random intercept by uh, methylation site and by the. But what if we could test expression? Uh, so then, you know, normally we would test a, methyl a single methylation probe in that figure I showed earlier. We would test a single methylation probe against a single expression probe. This way, we could test the methylation cluster against the exp an expression probe just by adding uh, an expression column for whichever expression probe we're interested to the, these covariates. The problem with this is I have a lot of expression probes and I want to do this for, you know, all 25,000 of them. So the way that I do that is this, I call it X for expression, but it doesn't have to be expression. So, um, so basically this goes, and, and for each probe in the expression matrix, you know, I have some constraints that they have to be, the sample, you know, you have uh, columns of samples, like I showed you, they have to call, the samples have to be in the same order in the methylation matrix and the expression matrix. And then here I'm forcing, enforcing some sort of locality with this X disk, so I'm only testing I test every methylation probe again, or every methylation region. It's a set of probes against uh, every expression probe within 50 kV of that upstream or downstream. And all this is automatically parallelized because that's a lot of tests. Um, and then just this is just to show you that this is a screenshot of top of that running on uh, I think it's 16 nodes or, or 16. CPUs on a single node, so this all is automatically parallelized from one one call, and you can see the the CPU column there. There's 16 R processes that are running at 100 percent. Um, and so the good thing about that is, in talking about data integration, is it doesn't have to be expression. If you don't, you don't need to specify these uh, the, the location and the distance. So you can just test against everything in a, in a parallelized fashion. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, sorry, there's where I showed the 2.5 billion tests, um, and that's you know only looking at 100,000 methylation regions. Um, so anyway, these these could be te you could test against uh, any any number of things, and again, you're te always testing methylation region, um, and so that could be you could be testing methylation region against uh, basically uh, species from the microbiome, any 
check up covariates that you want or genetic variants. Um, and so after I implemented this, then uh, I thought, well, you know, we know that, and what we always want to see is these local expression changes that are associated with nearby methylation changes. And so uh, if we find that, we can, in, in, in real data, we can say that's a, a true positive. And then if we, if we break up that relationship between expression and methylation, uh, we can still use the same model and, uh, you know, we, we're, not, we're not simulating the data in a way that has any biases. So we're just breaking this relationship between the, the methylation, groups of methylation and the expression probe. So when I do this and I call a false positive something that appears when I've broken that relationship and a true positive, it, it, it may not be a true positive and I may not get all of them, but it's finding a, it's finding a, a relationship. Um, and I, I don't know if they're true, but I can, uh, I, and so I've kind of mislabeled this table here, but with all these different methods, I can, you know, start to uh, kind of choose one where I'm looking for a very small ratio in, in the right most column there. Um, and I'm, in, in addition to that, I'm looking for a large value in the true plus because, uh, for example, the one with the lowest ratio that combines these score uh, has a, um, it's pretty conservative, so it finds few true positives. Whereas I may want to, I may want to find uh, more, more of these relationships. So these, these, I don't know if I was clear, but these are finding basically sites where methylation is correlated with expression, which is very often what we're interested in. Um, and so this is an example of the uh, output um, just from this. So if, if I tested, I think it was in that, those examples, it's about 70,000 uh, sites without the, this is not for expression, um, but if I test 70,000 DMRs, uh, I get 70,000 rows, and then the multiple testing adjustment is very straightforward. Uh, um, I'm not sure what I'm showing here. Oh, okay, so this is, this is the power I'm generating in this, the software also um, creates these images uh, and a blue green show up here. So basically this is a 17 probe or so DMR differential in the play region uh, with disease in the distribution of disease in green at each site and uh, the controls in blue. Um, so you can see here generally the disease status, the disease individuals have higher ventilation and that's reflected in the Covariate there. And so this is a fairly subtle DMR. If you test a single one of these sites, there's a few that are significant, but if you test them and then do even on the multiple testing correction on 17 probes, they're not significant. So this is the type of regions that we're uh, you know, looking for. And then also, I should point out that when I do combine them, the p value is quite significant. And that's just another way to plot that with the spaghetti plots. You can see how each individual tracks. Um, across the, the region there. Um, so an advantage of this is that once you have, if you have all this data, uh, in that instead of testing a single site, you're testing a, a, lot, a lot of sites, obviously. And so if you have only if you have only 20 individuals, which is you know that's not too many for a large study, well you have seven, then you have 17 sites times 20 individuals, so that becomes a lot of sites. Um, and so then you can remove outliers in an unbiased way without, you know, drastically reducing the number the numbers you're doing. So you can see it scattered across here. There's, you know, these things. And in methylation, we often have a lot of kind of weird stuff that we don't know whether to believe or not. But we can remove that in unbiased by just saying, well, we'll just remove anything that's what I, what I did is remove anything that's three standard deviations away from. The and so if we do that, remember the p-value before was something to the minus 8. Um, here it's become something to the minus 10, so it actually increases the significance. And so I should have probably presented that first, but in this table here, 
Um, you can see, uh, I've done in the top set outlier, no outlier removal, and the bottom set outlier removal. And the reason we can do that again is because we're kind of doing this, you know, testing these aggregated things. So if we have uh, a number of sam a number of people, or a number of samples, and a number of sites, if we remove a few sites, it's not, or we remove a few sites from a few samples, it's not reducing our numbers very much. And so you can see here, when, they, when you remove outliers, there's a lot of methods that improve. And so, Say, for example, um, the GEE autoregressive on the top, it finds two, uh, 274,000. Uh, on the bottom, it finds 300,000. And at the expense of a, a few false positives, but not many. Um, so anyway, that's something that I think people haven't taken advantage of in these, uh, these methods that aggregate data that I've been trying to explore. Um, so uh, another thing you can do is change various parameters how how, how tight the cluster you want them to be. So if you increase the clustering and get smaller DMRs, that may be more significant or more interesting uh, to you. Um, I'm still kind of developing this. I'm trying to figure out what which ones work best. Uh, and then uh, other uses are these. Uh, is SCAT basically compares. Uh, it looks at rare that it's built to look at rare variants, but you can also look at uh, methylation data. But in this framework, it doesn't matter if you send in methylation or uh, or, or genotypes. Basically, these are the SNPs, so basically those would be zero or one, whereas methylation is usually a ratio. Um, and usually, with this scat, you say I want to look at this gene and and all the SNPs in that gene, and say do these have uh, is there kind of a burden of of rare variants, so do the cases have more rare variants than the controls? But this way we can we can find clusters, first find clusters of SNPs that may, maybe they're upstream of the gene, they're affecting binding of transcription factor, uh, or you know maybe they're just in one exon of a gene. Uh, so I haven't explored this much, but I think that's one of them. Again, this is the same syntax, actually all this stuff, the last four lines are just um, optional. Um, arguments. Um, so, in the future, I'm going to work on uh, testing uh, different methods for simulating data. Although I think doing the, the relationship to expression is the most valid. Um, and what uh, the reason I started this is to, that we uh, we often have small samples. There's a lot of postdocs and grad students in lab that are doing uh, studies on you know maybe five and five, five you know five mice that are tolerized to some antigen, five control lines or something like that. So it, we, we have a, a weaker signal there and we need to be able to detect that. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing is to handle bisulfite sequencing data. So that's count based rather than ratio based. And so that takes a little different statistics. So I've been working on that. And then uh, ensemble methods, which look at all these different means of calling the DMRs and finding basically the kind of how, how you, you can use all that information to get better um, prediction of whether it is a, re a differential in the region, methylated region or not. And then I talked about this X for core relating methylation regions to expression, but you know, what if you want to relate them to expression, to all the expression in the area, all the genotypes in the area at the same time? Uh, I, I'm not sure how to do that yet, but that's what I'd like to get to. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. It appears you've worked with a lot of different data sources. What type of uh, technologies and procedures are you using for data integration? Uh, well, what do you mean by data integration? How are you integrating all these different data sources into? Uh, one database that you can start playing with. Well, you know, that part of the thing is that I guess we're not. Um, so for for every, for each one, there's a, there's traditional analyses that you do, and they're in they're in expression, they're in methylation, um, and and they all have fairly standard formats. Like the, the slide I showed you, Chris, from the on the 
the second one to show that the way sequencing comes off the sequencers, you, you get it like that and you do an alignment and then you get this standard format. Um, I think as with anything, if you want, want the trouble comes when you want to do a custom analysis that, uh, that, that doesn't take the, that doesn't work with the data format that you're given. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess I'm not sure how to answer your question, really. And a follow up, how are frontline physicians using bioinformatics and practices? Frontline physicians? Yeah. Um, you mean like, you mean labs in the university here? Or? No, I mean like physicians. Oh, physicians. Doctors who are okay. actually treating some physicians. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there's some of uh, this, uh, there, there's people here doing work on that, uh, doing some sequencing, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not involved with that. We, ours is more basic research, but I think uh, I think there is some of that. You can you can basically send your data to a, a MySeq, which is a kind of a small sequencer, and get it back in a few days from an automated pipeline with all you know all variants that are likely to be very uh, that at least deserve some sort of follow up, you know, in in something that's small enough to put in Excel. So I think I think people are starting to do that actually. Is there a service here at the University of Colorado on the Anschutz campus that would uh, allow us to sequence our own genome? Uh, yeah, if you pay them. How much is it? I'm just curious. Um, I would guess it's probably five thousand. Uh, I'm not sure. To be honest, I imagine that's coming down every year. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's down to it's it's definitely coming down. But you know now the the problem is, uh, I mean, what do you what what you would get from them? You probably, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how well, useful. That's my next question. How useful is it? What you would get from them? Yeah. Um. Well, you know there they, there are tools that will <coughs> annotate these variants that you have and tell you, okay, this is causing a missense in this very important gene that you need, you know, so you could, you could, as long as they're, as long, by, by, you would have to pay for the analysis in addition to the, just the sequencing, because the 5,000 would probably be just the sequencing. Um, yeah. So, I, I, once you had them, once you had them annotated, basically at that level, it, it's fairly similar to what you get from 23 and me, although they have a chip, and so you're limited to the 500,000 sites that they uh, assay. So. What's all the interest in regulation when you get to a correlation to cancer? There's definitely a correlation to cancer. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical about methylation. I think you know, it's more, it's more that, well, gene expression is very dynamic, but you, you definitely, you have huge changes generally, in, in, or you can have huge changes if you choose the right tissue. In methylation, uh, we find that sometimes we don't see the changes. So it could be that we're measuring at the wrong, the wrong time. Uh, so maybe, you know, these are, say, on unstimulated uh, blood cells. So you can stimulate them with an allergen or something that you may see more of a response. But we're, we're, if we're looking for something that can be used to differentiate asthmatics from non-asthmatics, we want to use, well, we tend to have to use blood, peripheral blood cells. And so we have to use what we have. But in, in cancer, there's huge changes in methyl methylation. Uh, and does the cell have to methylate or DNA to express protein? Well, if you don't have any methylation, the organism will die. Uh, I'm, I'm almost certain. Well, if if the entire you know promoter of the gene is is methylated, in in most cases, you would assume that the gene will not be expressed. So methylation is associated with decreased expression. In, in, that's 
that's the general idea. Um, but well, you know, it, 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 methylation is also associated with, associated with closed chromatins, and then if the DNA is all crumbled up, you, you, nothing can get there to transcribe the gene. So, that's, so what causes the DNA to suddenly decide to express it? Well, repeat, please. <laughs> she asked what, what causes the DNA to suddenly express itself. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that, that's similar to the question that uh, someone had asked Dom, I, I mean, there's a lot of, there, there's, I mean, there's a lot going on in the cell, uh, in every cell, um, and methylation is certainly a part of it. Um, you know, proteins are telling the DNA to unfold or open. So they don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So, in general, do we know what causes mes methylation of certain regions, or do we just have no idea? Do we just know, oh, that's methylated and it has this effect, but we don't know what the cause. Well, there's. <laughs> you're asking me a biology question, but there's there's these things called methyl transferases that that methylate DNA. Uh, what causes them to methylate the DNA? I'm not sure. Um, you know, there's some, the reason, part of the reason it's called epigenetics is that some of the sites it, 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 that, that are methylated are transferred to, to, the, to your offspring. And so you, you yeah, these, are, these regions are called imprinted regions. So whatever methylation sites you have in those regions may be transferred to your offspring. And so the methylation must also be um, duplicated when the DNA is duplicated. Is that correct? Yeah, that I think that's the maybe Don pay to that, but yeah. Okay. But there's also mechanisms to um, to clean the slate, right? Because you couldn't, you know, you wouldn't be the sum of all methylation events in human history, right? So there's opportunities to kind of clear the slate, but it was it was initially kind of hypothesized to be a stable marker of gene expression. Whether or not it is, or how much it changes the day. Yeah, I think one thing that we're learning is that, it, well, we you have to take the tissue that you have, and it's easiest to get blood. Um, you know, we study asthmatic kids, and it'd be great to get lung tissue, but that's you can't. <laughs> that's a little difficult, you know. Um, Aren't they talking that up? <laughs> Well, they have actually even if you can you can get nasal epithelium from from them and they don't even like that and that's just that's a cotton swab. I mean, it's uncomfortable, but and that we see a much better signal in there. But since it's so easy to get blood, that's that's kind of well, I would say we, that's what we want to work with. But that's what we, we have to build any tools we're going to build based on that because that's what we can get and that's what is going to be available. So. So, out of all this, like, basically, you, know, you have people who are doing wild experiments where they're exposing um, some species or not, like that, to some stimulus. Mm -hmm. And then you're taking it and they're doing this bisulfite um, analysis where you take apart however many million genes you have and figure out what those are methylated. Mm -hmm. You're trying to simply um, compare the two different cases and then come up with a correlation between these different spikes and methylation or something like that. That's an algorithm. Well in, in terms of in the in the methylation, yeah, we map the reads back to the genome. But that I mean that's essentially it, but a lot of these are exploratory, so we, we don't know I mean, asthma is a very complex disease, and there's a, a very strong environmental factor. So, when there's a strong environmental factor, then people want to look at methylation because methylation is changed by your environment. Um, and so, that's maybe that's the, the, the reason. And so, then we're if we're doing exploratory, then we'll say, here's here's all the the or here, here's all the cases, here's all the controls, and then find all the reg regions in the genome where they're different, and then try and find the story that we can. Believe about that. No. 
<laughs> sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Brent Anderson, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this is the start of uh, a wonderful relationship with the Anschutz campus. We'd like to hold more events here. If any of you have any suggestions on uh, different topics, uh, please email me or call me and I'll try to find somebody who's an expert in that area. I also want to urge you to go over to the Data Science Association website uh, join if you haven't already. It's free for a year. We're holding a survey. We want to determine the interest, whether or not enough people are interested in having a three-day forum ski retreat in Vail uh, in March. So if you would go over, it'll take you 15 seconds to go over and take the survey. We'd really like to uh, know if people are interested in doing that. Uh, we're going to head on over to the Cedar Creek Pub, which I think is about three blocks north uh, up here. It's very, very close. Uh, would love for you to join us. Uh, we're just going to go for a little bit. I need to get home around 10 o'clock, so we won't be staying long. Would love to uh, chat with you a little bit longer. And thank you all for coming.